Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. We have a kind of light crowd here, so um, I'm sure folks will be filtering in, but I'm going to get started anyway. My name is Karen Taylor Goodrich. Um, for introductions yeah. coming through a few times now. I'm um, the superintendent of North Cascades National Park Service Complex, but also chair of the North Cascades Ecosystem Subcommittee. So I'll be doing a presentation today on our goals and accomplishments, and then also a separate presentation. I'm going to ask our project lead for the park on our EIS to do a separate update on the, the EIS process specifically. So we've broken the presentation down into, um, these are closely aligned with the strategic plan, I, I promise. Um, all of these are, so we've broken it down into what the action items were for the 2015 period, followed by the accomplishments. So that's the organization. Okay, this was our first planned action item folks over there at PC. That's right, and I won't go into the details here, but this is the restoration EIS for the North Cascades ecosystem. Actually, let me go back a little bit. You can see, just as a little context here for people that have not been to North Cascades or the entire ecosystem, you'll see that it goes, we consider it from I-90 outside of Seattle all the way to Cleelum, up further north and then to the Canadian border and much further beyond is the official ecosystem. The, the area that the environmental impact study will cover is just the lower 48 portion of um, North Cascades ecosystem. Okay, again, this is our accomplishment, the notice of intent to prepare an environmental impact statement um, for the restoration of the grizzly of the North Cascades. It was published in February. We had six different scoping meetings right after the publication, 500 attendees, and almost 3,000 comments. We also just had our draft alternatives development workshop that was interagency. Our partners, and Jack will go into a little more detail on this, um, the two lead agencies, National Park Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and our cooperating agencies, um, by agreement are the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I'd like to recognize Bob Everett here, who is also on our subcommittee, and then of course the U.S. Forest Service. So we have representation not only at the subcommittee level, but also on the, the various committees or teams as part of the EIS. Another member of our subcommittee here is Tony Hamilton. Um, just want to acknowledge the um, members, and then Jack Wolfe is our tech team member as well as the EIS project. So you'll see that it's a very large area. Um, the darker, of course, is the National Park Service complex. Uh, much of it wilderness, about 94% of our park complex is designated wilderness, surrounded by the Okanagan Wenatchee and the Mount Baker Snow Quality Forest, and then also quite a bit of wilderness, designated wilderness in those complexes as well. I won't spend a lot of time, again, I'm trying to read this for you, but you can see the technical uh, team did a lot of work in advance. And then, of course, we talked about over 2,900 comments. This is just a little sampling here. Some of the concerns, supporting restoration of an endangered species, uh, ecosystem health, another step toward restoring a complete suite of predators. Um, con concerns meaning positive or negative, this is just the kinds of comments that are received. Uh, that they were historically in the area and should be brought back. Potential for agricultural depredation, depredation livestock, orchard crops, etc. Personal safety, of course, that came up pretty much in all the scoping meetings as well. And then across the spectrum, those who work in recreation ecosystem um, and how they be affected. So our recreational users, um, we've had a chance to meet with those folks. We've done at least Outside of the official six scoping meetings, we've done at least 15 different outreach events to various you know, interest groups, individual organizations, um, and including the recreational users and, and other groups like backcountry horsemen and you know, community groups. Another um, concern that was brought up is how will we address the existing statute. Um, this is a state statute, RCW 77. Um, which has a limitation on um, the import of grizzly bear from outside the state for these kinds of um, plants. Okay, just a little media coverage here. Okay, 
Okay, and then of course we're at the outreach uh, part of our goal, and this is you know, working closely in partnership like all of our ecosystems do, but um, and then also working closely with the Western Wildlife um, Outreach Group. Our accomplishments in that way, um, we've been working uh, very closely with um, all of our partners on the EIS. We have a communications team of public information officers from each of the agencies, and they've been very aggressive about um, a lot of the press releases together. Um, we're on sync as partners. And these are staffed by the interpretation, education, and outreach folks from the various agencies. Um, and you can see the four different agencies that are contributing here. I mentioned the six community meetings that we had in addition to briefings to the Washington State Legislature. That was the Natural Resources Subcommittee of the Legislature. Um, we provided a full briefing on the EIS process for them. And of course, we, we've been working with our, our tribes, providing separate um, consultation as well as with our congressional staff, uh, county commissioners. I can't, Jack, I don't know how many county commissioner offices you went to, but we're trying to uh, make it more personal, go one-on-one -on -one with these various forms of local government as well as the, the tribes. Um, and another outreach tool that we have now is uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service took um, over responsibility for the bear trailer and um, we've had a chance to use that throughout the summer um, both for local education and then various events um, and then you could, as you know, the Bear Education Trailer is um, dedicated to education and safety and, and we've dedicated the use of that trailer at this point for um, educating people about the EIS as well as um, bear ecology, behavior, safety. We also have it um, stationed at our visitor center in New Halem. If you've ever been to the North Cascades Visitor Center, when it's not going to Various events, you know, the salmon festivals, um, every you know, a number of different events, and it's including you know, school school programs, and it's stationed at the visitor center, North Cascades National Park. And um, the first day that it was there, within two hours, we had over 400 visitors to the trailer at that at that parking lot. So it gets a lot of um, really a lot of uh, strong um, attendance at that point. We still continue to work with Washington, um, excuse me, Western Wildlife Outreach, uh, Lorna and Daryl, and they um, actually have a, thanks to our friends in U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, have funding and they just purchased a new trailer. So we'll have the benefit in our ecosystem of having two trailers, one more focused on Cabela kind of events and um, King County. Um, they just received some funding from the INE program to do more bear outreach in an urban area in King County outside of Seattle specifically. And then we'll focus on school groups as well as, you know, more EIS specific with the trailer that um, the agencies are using and staffing with federal employees. Okay, so the next reporting requirement is reporting specifically on any observations we may have, accomplishments to this end. Um, we had one credible sighting north of the border in British Columbia this year, so we, of course, follow up on all of that. And that's our friend Tony. Access management was the next uh, goal for us in 2015. Um, this is, uh, you've seen this on our work plan pretty much every year, and at this point, um, I'll go straight to the accomplishments. Uh, each forest is in a different state of where they are with their forest management forest plans. And so we're reliant on that process to identify um, where we look actually to, to move forward on some of the access issues. So we don't have right now a timeline, as you can see, for the release of the EIS for the Okanagan Wenatchee. And then we're still waiting on some funding. Uh, we mean collectively the Forest Service is still waiting on funding for the Mount Baker Snoqualm and to get underway. Okay, we, we do intend to reevaluate the core areas and road management in the western part of the recovery area. That's uh, the Mount Baker Snow Colony Forest. And our next action item is sanitation. Uh, this, the 
The goal there is to expand NPS food storage requirements to other federal lands and the ecosystem. We've not made a lot of progress in that um, arena, and you'll see in our 2016 work plan that we'll be working towards uh, benchmarking some of the other ecosystems that do have those positive orders so we can take a look at those and, and try to look at recommendations to the global forest to adopt those. Okay, so let me talk a little bit more about 2016. Sorry, right here. So as you can see, we're very, very focused on the environmental impact uh, statement and getting that move moving forward. The ecosystem subcommittee uh, the format and organization that is a strong contributor to that as well as the various teams that have been organized underneath the EIS and our partners. So we did have, I mentioned we had um, a, uh, the first um, alternative development workshop the week before our last had great representation from the state, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Forest Service at that meeting did a lot of work in two days. Um, once we have a draft EIS, which is expected late next summer, then we'll be going back out for a series of public meetings that will be open for, the comment period will be open for at least 60 days. We'll do at least six more meetings. We'll probably add a couple more communities um, in the foothills on both sides of the mountains so we can have a span, you know, a broader range of communities that may not have been able to get to the scope of meetings. And that was based on a lot of comments we have. We're just going to learn as we go. The technical team will continue to provide support to the NPS contractor. Um, and just for, for information's sake here, our EIS, we have a project manager. But the EIS um, at large is being funded by the National Park Service, and that comes with, that's done through our environmental quality division from the Washington office, and that process allows for a project manager. Then we have local project leads, and then, of course, various um, teams assigned within that. But that also allows um, a contractor to really do the heavy lifting on the writing of the document. The agencies are still facilitating doing the, the working, the work on the alternatives and all the, a lot of the technical work that goes up to them, but we have the, the benefit of a contractor putting it all together for us in a, in a document. So that document, which will be the, the next phase, is the, the draft EIS expecting to come out in late fall, and then we'll do this, the, the another round of public meetings. They'll be very well advertised, and um, we'll also have an online system for comments, and we'll take comments at these meetings as well, or you can write down if you want. So let's move down to outreach here. Um, we're gonna continue to work closely with our partners, and, and, and the NGOs, other agencies, our tribes, local residents, um, and to build support and understanding. Uh, grizzly recovery and ecosystem health, and specifically we're doing uh, additional, I mentioned we've done at least 15 different additional presentations to various groups um, since we had our original scoping meetings. We had a number of INE um, and outreach of events activities as part of a larger communication plan for the EIS, um, and that will include uh, more work with the bear trailer and then also working, continuing to work with WWO and, and making sure that uh, they're plugged in as they do some of their work. Um, so we've been able to cover a broader range of having a lot more people involved in the outreach, outreach uh, from various NGO organizations and the federal agencies. So I uh, very much appreciate the, the contributions of, of all of our partners, the state and Forest Service, and certainly our lead partner, Fish and Wildlife Service, in, in providing the, the staff time, energy, and just um, we're, we're on track. This is exactly where we wanted to be as far as time goes. Um, one other piece that we're doing, and this is being funded um, in an effort through my office at the park, is a five-minute um, educational video, essentially a MythBuster kind of video. And you probably all remember Chris Morgan, of course. He started the GBOP, or the Grizzly Bear Outreach Program, back in the day. And he's now working, and he has his own business now, Wildlife Media, and he's done a number of um, TBS and um, various uh, kinds of documentaries. More recently, I think it was, it was on the ring of things, various things. Anyway, he has agreed 
um, and to work with us, and he'll be doing a five-minute educational video that we'll be able to, it's, the focus really will be um, um, trying to, to put a more human face on it. So he's had a chance to interview a number, a diverse range of, of uh, constituents around the Cascades, from ranchers to you know, hikers to equestrian users, and to just talk about what you know, the, the grizzly bears and the concept of grizzly bear restoration in the North Cascades means to people. And so this video will capture some of that, but also talk a lot about safety, their ecology, of course, behavior, uh, really ref reflecting those diverse perspectives around the Cascades, but, but more of a, um, a, uh, a five minute, very uh, relatively straightforward educational piece. So I'd like to show that at the summer meeting. Uh, when we come back again and do some more report out, so I'll do that. So I'm going to turn this over to Jack, and he'll do a more specific update on the EIS. Um, again, I'm Jack Elfke. I work at North Cascades National Park and I'm uh, heavily involved in the EIS process in the thick of things. So Karen hit a lot on uh, you know, what's happening uh, you know, in the immediate time with the EIS, both in 2015 and I'm looking forward. I want to just do a few slides, uh, provide a little context, because this is a big darn deal for us, what we're doing here now. It's, it's a culmination of a lot of years of effort of trying to get here. And, and then I'll talk in particular about a few things going forward. Um, so I know you all know this, but it's, it's worth pointing out. You know, we're the, we're the uh, ecosystem uh, way to the west. Uh, about 10,000 square miles on the on the U.S. side. You can see in the uh, kind of the, the lightened area how indeed this does extend into B.C. And B.C. is very much a part of this ecosystem. But it's, you know, it's of comparable size to the Northern Continental Divide in Yellowstone. Uh, the big difference is, is you all have hundreds of bears. We, we probably have, you can count on one hand, uh, we have it's been that way for, for quite some time. So we're in a very, very different place uh, today from where uh, folks are here in the ecosystems here in Rockies. Um, just a couple things to point out here. Uh, really, again, to provide some context, the decision was made back in 91 on the bottom here uh, by the IGBC that the North Cascades uh, would become one of the recovery zones. So, you know, that's many years ago. And by 1997, uh, we finally got our recovery plan. So we've been essentially, so recovery for the North Cascades is, as I've been saying, it's kind of been simmering now for almost 20 years. Uh, we had a number of tasks identified is needing to get done um, to get us toward recovery, um, all of which uh, you know, along the lines of, of the science to back up uh, recovery planning, um, the interim net, sanitation, access management, all that has been, work, been worked on you know, almost for 20 years. The one thing, of course, that was holding us up always was we hadn't done the, we hadn't done the EIS uh, to get us uh, moving forward with recovery. And you can see in the bottom there, late 2014, we finally, um, through a lot of work by a number of people, and again, I'll call out Tammy uh, in particular for the funding and, and helping to pull folks together, uh, that finally came together in, in 2014 to get started down with the EIS plan. And it's worth pointing out for the CIS the purpose, that's such a critical statement and any EIS, and I'm going to read it, the purpose of this plan in EIS is to determine how to restore the grizzly bear to the North Cascades ecosystem, a portion of its historic range. Again, I, I spend a lot of time on the road with uh, talking to folks, and, and I, I point out that you know, the decision about whether this ecosystem 
was going to get prison bars back in. That was made in 1991 by this group. This, this EIS is how to restore prison bars. So it's a critical distinction that's, um, of course, of keen interest by uh, the public. Uh, Karen talked about who's involved. So you, you can see there who's involved in EIS. And the schedule she's pointed out, you know, we're, we're about, we're on track, um, you know, trying to development. The meeting just happened. And again, if things go according to plan, uh, two years from now, perhaps, hopefully, okay, we'll stand up here and tell you what the record of decision is uh, for, for how to move forward with recovery. Um, and then just a few uh, closing thoughts I have. Um, you know, Karen said this, I spend a lot of time on the road going out to different uh, groups, whether it's county commissioners or uh, various recreational user groups. I was with the Washington Backcountry Horsemen uh, last Friday. Um, th this ecosystem, our ecosystem is in such a different place from where Yellowstone and the Northern Continental Divide. Here we have <clears throat> hundreds or you know, approaching thousand grizzly bears that, that never, you know, you've not had ecosystems where there haven't been bears. Uh, grizzly bears, whereas our ecosystem uh, for for decades, for the life of most of the people who live and recreate in that ecosystem, haven't lived with grizzly bears. And so this idea of, of uh, you know, what's it going to mean to, to me as an individual to, uh, to live and, and recreate in, in grizzly bear country is a big darn deal. And, and that message to try and get across to them uh, about how it can work and here's what it's going to take and so on is becoming more and more a part of what we have to be talking about with, with folks. Um, and I was so striking yesterday to hear Kerry Gunther talk about the tens of thousands of tweets he was getting about you know, from perhaps a misguided passion about uh, removing one bear and, and around the other side of trying to convince avid conservationists yeah, that, that they can live and recreate safely. Um, we had this alternative development meeting uh, and we outlined um, possible alternatives going forward. I can't go into them to meet the process. We, you know, the, these thoughts and, uh, haven't been vetted well. Uh, you know, it's worth mentioning, of course, we have to do no action. And, and one bit about that is, is we had commonly been slipping into the terminology of saying the no action is the natural recovery alternative, uh, let bears recover naturally, and, and we found that uh, we're, we're getting away from using that term because there's, there's, an, there's an appeal to that thought to just let bears recover here naturally. You know, if we don't have to get in there and muck around and, and be a part of that. Uh, but, you know, the, the reality is, is um, it, that's, that's not what no action is. And, and anyway, we'll go through uh, and, and, and play that one out. There are several action alternatives, and I, and I will say that they all involve some variation of bringing in bears from outside into the North Cascades ecosystem. And then the science and, uh, aspect of this, you know, a lot of work has gone on in the past to support uh, the science side of things of, of recovering grizzly bears to the North Cascades. The, the lesson that we had gleaned from the Bitterroot EIS uh, about 15 years ago is, is they got hit late with um, the need to do some modeling to try and get at what might be the carrying capacity for that ecosystem. And, and so we tried to get ahead of that because we don't have that kind of information as well. And so uh, we, you can see the two things we are pursuing here is uh, some of you may remember Andrew Lyons, uh, Bill Gaines, both ex-Forest Service mm -hmm. biologists on Okanagan Wenatchee. They've, they've got lots of, of habitat use information for black bears that we're, we're going to try and model what that might mean for grizzly bears and then from that uh, derive a, uh, some sort of population estimate for the ecosystem. And then the, what the Bitterroot did was uh, the Boyce and Waller resource selection fun, uh, function model. We're, we're going to try and, and work off of that. Dr. John, I know there's some potential concerns uh, about that, and uh, I've talked to Sesquitron, uh, pointing me towards Cecily. Uh, I talked to Tabitha here, so uh, we got some things to, to think about uh, about uh, that, that second bullet, but um, 
anyway, we want to go forward, and certainly one of the common things we are being asked by the public is how many bears is this ecosystem going to support? Right? And this, hopefully through this, these efforts will be, get us uh, at least a number we can uh, reasonably get behind to, to put out to the public. So, um, I don't know if, uh, you know, I'd like to offer uh, Jim from the state or, or Robin or uh, Tony, any of you who are involved in the EIS, if you have anything else you want to comment on. And Chris, Chris is actively involved in so, so I don't know if there's any comments you may have. I promise to be brief, which is unusual for me in front of a microphone. So first thing is that um, when you're on stage with Chris Morgan, you know, as handsome and dynamic and intelligent as I am, I got nothing on this guy. I mean, he's he's really amazing. So you know, when when uh, we talk about that video this summer, it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. So he can he can move a crowd like like none of us. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I also wanted to pass on my acknowledgments to Tammy for her contribution to getting this. Uh, we're going to miss that energy around the table and. Um, Without her uh, input us to get this thing underway, I don't think we'd be where we're, we're at. One thing I'd like to follow up on, um, Jack, uh, with regard to the idea of natural recolonization. You know, we, we have been pointed to as this repository of grizzly bears on our side of the border to naturally recolonize North Cascades, and I can tell you that's just not going to happen. Um, certainly not in our lifetimes, and, and probably not for even longer. When you look at the data on our side of the border, yeah, we got a picture this year. That's the second bear in five years that we know about, with some pretty intensive looking uh, on our side of the border. Uh, we're not sure about that, the sex. Uh, Chris passed the photograph around a bunch of experts. Uh, I think it's a male. I don't think there's uh, what might be constituted or, or defined as a population which would be at least two females or one female breeding successive litters. We have no evidence of that in the last few decades uh, for either side of the border that would constitute the, the basis of even an augmentation. And so we as a technical working group and a subcommittee have recommended that we refer to population restoration as the activity that the EIS should contemplate. Um, I have some contingency uh, funding available. If we do get a credible sighting, we gave $10,000 on the BC side to a hotline for sighting reporting. And um, then that comes to a very select few of us. We decide if it's worth field follow-up. We get out there and get photographs and, and DNA if we can. Uh, I haven't had to spend that contingency money. We, we didn't get any air off that one there this year. We tried hard, but it was gone before we, uh, we could get any reasonable samples. Um, I think I'd like to make the executive committee aware of something that I brought forward to both the subcommittee and the EIS uh, group, and that is that British Columbia is having a difficult time anticipating a request by the federal agencies for grizzly bears for population restoration in the light of the Washington State RCW. And so I've had some informal discussions. I hope that, uh, Jim, that we can come up to Victoria and we can maybe get some uh, discussions going on whether or not that's perception or reality. Our uh, people are nervous about, uh, we have a long cooperative history on environmental files with Washington State and um, it would put us in a real awkward position if the request comes forward from the federal agencies for grizzly bears from British Columbia uh, in the light of the RCW. So that's a bit of a, a near-term priority as far as I'm concerned. Uh, just to support Jack in terms of the uh, carrying capacity work, we did some cross-border uh, uh, roads work very recently, and we've got a technical report that we submitted to the subcommittee using some of the road density and roadlessness techniques that are that are current to 2015. And uh, the hope is that we will 
model that capability on both sides of the border so that we could eventually, if British Columbia decides to recover, and I want to make sure that everybody's clear that it's still an if on our side, uh, that you know we too have done the preparatory work in terms of uh, what level of population expectation we could have uh, in respect of the, the habitat conditions on our side of the border. Unlike uh, Sel Selkirk's, unlike some of the obvious uh, flathead to Northern Continental Divide cross-border uh, ecosystems, this is one where things are reversed. We're actually dependent probably for recovery of grizzly bears on our side of the border on that great big bunch of wilderness that Karen showed. So it's, a, it's an upside down situation for this one for us on a cross-border basis. Well, thank you. <laughs>